Loving God, we thank you that the end is never the end, that you are always with us, always making things new. Open in us today, O oh God, a space for your newness to be made known. Help us to know your presence and love today, not just of and for us, but of and for others as well. Walk alongside of us and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me as we sing together hymn number 623, Rock of Ages, Please Rise. We gather as we live, we gather as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways and free us to serve those in need. Amen. Hear the good news. God, who makes all things new, forgives you your sins for Jesus' sake and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
Please be seated as together we hear God's holy word. The first reading is from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The book of Daniel is an example of apocalyptic literature, which is full of strange visions and symbolism. Arising during times of great persecution, apocalyptic literature is concerned with God's revelation about the end time and the coming kingdom of God, when God will vindicate the righteous who have been persecuted. A reading from Daniel. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish, such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 10. Images of worship and sacrifice are used throughout Hebrews to highlight what Christ has uniquely accomplished through his death. Because we have received forgiveness through Christ's death, we live with sincere hearts by trusting in God's promises and encouraging love and good works from each other. A reading from Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write, I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering of sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the mountain, Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. 
this must take place, but the end is still to come, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you that in Christ Jesus, whose death and resurrection for us destroys the power of sin and death, that we might know forgiveness, life, and salvation. Fill us with your hope to trust that what we see is not all that is happening before us, that your work is not limited by our imagination, that your love extends far beyond what we, would, what we could see or believe for ourselves. Fill us, Lord Christ, Fill us with your love and your hope and your peace. Fill us with your salvation. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus, grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was in college, uh, I attended Lutheran campus ministry, but I also attended, every once in a while, a group of people who came from fundamentalist churches. I started attending because I was invited. Uh, I started to attend because I didn't really know what they, how they read the Bible or what they thought. And the very first night I showed up, they began talking about the end of the world. And, as you might imagine, they had a rather bleak understanding of what that looked like, how some would die and go straight to hell, how the world would be torn apart and left in flames, how people were afraid and people uh, uh, fought one another. This was in the fall of 1989. And to watch history unfold since then, there's always some inkling in the air that the end, as I heard it in 1989, was upon us, is upon us. What will the end of the world look like? What will it bring? Is there fear to be had? Should we give heed to the fear? Should we prepare ourselves for the end as if we can protect ourselves from the encroaching end? So many movies and books and so many pieces of music dedicate themselves to what the end will look like. And it's never pretty, and it's never hopeful. There's always a deep sense of fear that sort of undergirds it all. Is this what God had in mind for the end of the world? There are some who read the book of Revelation as if it's true, as if we needed to worry about the end of the world. But then we come to these verses from Mark's Gospel. We come to these verses that are known, that are part of a chapter. Mark 13 is known as the Gospel writer Mark's Little Apocalypse. People have thought of, thought of Apocalypse as kind of the end of the world. 
But really, the word apocalypse means a revealing, an uncovering, to give us some vision into what God is up to. And the reading and the these particular verses counter every last piece of apocalyptic literature that suggests the end is something we need to be afraid of. Indeed, the end is not something we need to be afraid of. The end is never the end, is never the end. They're standing at the temple. The disciples see these large buildings. The Gospel of Mark is written in the context of the destruction of the temple. So here we see the disciples there, and they begin to wonder what happens when, when the temple falls apart, as if it hadn't yet, though it had. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. Now one could not be afraid just because Jesus said so. Because Jesus is, after all, the one whose body is destroyed, who dies and is raised from the dead for our sake. Jesus dies and is raised so that we who die will be raised. But Jesus plays with this image of the, of the stones that are falling down. I try to imagine what it's like for those who built that temple. The temple is the very center of the society. If the temple is destroyed, everything is destroyed. To watch the temple come apart. Is it fiery? Is there chaos? One would think so, given its import in any society back then. Jesus says, beware that no one lead you astray. And I think here, I would echo that and say, do not listen to the voices that will lead you astray. Do not believe that the end is the end is the end is the end, and you need to be afraid of it. A friend of mine wrote recently concerning these verses that the very stones that, are, that fall from the building are the very stones that Jesus, that are removed from the tomb so that people could see that Jesus was raised from the, from the dead. Wherever there is death or destruction, new life is not far behind. This is the thing that is uncovered, that is revealed in something like the destruction of the temple and the, in the destruction of a church and the destruction of a community in the destruction of a marriage, in the destruction of friendships, in the destruction of all the things that fall apart. And in our world, it feels like there's never an end to things falling apart. But these things are not the end. Not now, not ever. For Jesus, who died and was raised from the dead, promises that in death there is life. You know, when Jesus was put in the tomb, it thought, they thought that Jesus, that the, the movement that had Jesus at the center was over. But it wasn't. I'm reminded of a, one of the times I went to South Africa, I brought a group of youth, and we refurbished um, a worship space uh, alongside black Lutheran South African youth. And the person who lived next door 
was white and did not believe that blacks were human beings. And he saw to it in the middle of the night after we had almost completed it, he saw to it that the, that the building was set on fire. Because he did not want them near him. We came back the next day, and we know that he set it on fire because he told us. And we rebuilt it. And we invited him to join us in rebuilding it. And he did come over and he did talk to us. And we invited him to worship alongside us. And every time I saw him as I passed by his place, I stopped to invite him to worship, to join us in rebuilding, to join us in life together. Because there's something beyond the hatred. There's something beyond the brokenness. There's something beyond the death that hovers in the air in the world in which we live, the air that we breathe. There is more than death, more than destruction, more than a fiery end. Jesus promises that what, what the disciples are seeing is just the beginning, but it is not the end. It is not the end. The end is resurrection. The end is new life. The end is forgiveness. The end is reconciliation. The end is friendship in Christ. The reconciliation, the new thing that's happening there, the new thing that is happening here, it's something we can't foresee, but it is something that is promised. That even when an end comes, there is new life. That even when it feels as if hatred has won, love sneaks in the back door. When it seems like we're on our own, the wind blows through, letting us know that God is right there with us. A bird sings, letting us know that through bird song, Christ is singing a new song in our midst. Martin Luther was supposed to have said, but he didn't actually, but he was supposed to have said, if I knew the end of the world was coming, I'd plant an apple tree. He didn't say it, but he should have. It's very similar to things that he said. That is to say that when we face the end, we face it with hope and trust and confidence and peace because we are in the hands of a God who is gracious and merciful, who holds us tight and will not let us go, who walks alongside of us, when we feel like we're walking the long, dusty road alone, the one, who, the one who speaks to us where we feel the most afraid. You are not alone, he says. Oh, sure, things will die. Things will be torn apart. A future may look insurmountable might seem like there's no hope to be had anymore. But Jesus said, this is just the beginning. This is not the end. This is not the last word. This is not the final straw. For there is more to be, more that will happen. And you'll know that it's happened. Because hope will have won. You'll know it has happened 
because forgiveness has settled into the, into the soil around us. You'll know that this has happened when the question isn't about others' worthiness, but rather about how we might love our neighbor. You'll know it has happened when Christ calls your name, when Christ speaks into your life, when Christ utters a promise and makes good on it, that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Not here, not now, not ever. For we are the Lord's. Thanks be to God. Amen. Together we have heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, so let us join together confessing our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of life, and life everlasting. Amen. God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of, the, tell of and enact your reconciling love. God, in your mercy. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safely to a sheltered place in a more abundant season. God, in your mercy. God, our ruler, you write your law on human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all elected leaders and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. God, of, God in your mercy. God, our stronghold, you are present amid disaster. We pray for those affected by natural disasters. Come to the aid of all survivors of earthquakes, famines, floods, hurricanes, and wildfires, and the first responders who support them. Calm their fear, supply their need, and be the solid ground beneath their feet. God, in your mercy. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, and questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints and the love of Christ. God, in your mercy. Together we pray for Ricky, Jill, Yvonne, Donald, Warren, Tom, Roger, Tom, Sandy, and Roger, and those in care centers like Gail, Flossie, Ruth, Lucille, and Zelda. God, in your mercy. God, our beginning and end, your beloved people shine like the brightness of the sky. We thank you for the lives of all who rest in your eternal mercy. From famous saints to people we have loved, assure us of your resurrection promise. God, in your mercy. God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. At this time, we, we would typically collect the offering, and certainly you can leave your offering at the back of the church. I want to say thank you to all who support the ministry and mission of this congregation so very much. Let us join together praying in unison the offering prayer. Holy God, the earth is yours and everything in it, yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. and strengthen us to be your body for the world, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are God's gifts for you, God's people. Come, eat, drink, for in them Christ makes us new. You may be seated.
Please rise. Now may the body and blood of our crucified and risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which you have just received, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. We pray together. Blessed Jesus, at this table you have been for us both host and meal. Now send us forth to extend our tables and to share your gifts until that day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is our uh, Blessings and Honor, number 854.